Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and it, uh, this is the last time, I think, that we're presenting uh, this talk that I've been touring with uh, this year. We, uh, the Nostradamus report is, is read in a lot of places, um, several continents and, and so on. Uh, and it's very nice to be able to finish this tour uh, at Lindholmen, uh, who of course was our main funding partner still uh, for this report. That said, and this is relevant uh, for what I'm going to talk about, one of the things I'm talking about today is that all of our funding is public money from different sources, of course, including our new partner, main supporter, uh, Film Ivest. And, and, uh, and this is one of the many things that we are doing with public funding uh, in and around the film industry uh, in Europe. Uh, I always show this slide, it's a little mnemonic, a little, it helps you remember what the, what the report is called, so you can, uh, you can find it later on göteborgfilmfestival.se slash Nostradamus. It's not the Nosferatu report, it is not the Nostromo report, even though I always have a lot of love for people who remember the name of the spaceship from Aliens, that's cool. Uh, Nostradamus was a, a 16th century um, occultist, basically, who claimed to see the future. Uh, and basically, he was just saying a lot of incoherent things, possibly uh, based on uh, taking a lot of drugs. Uh, that is not my method. What we like to do every year, uh, apart from reading a lot of the public data that's available, all of those PDFs that you get links about in your email and that you then don't have time to read, we try to read those. And in addition, we do usually nine or ten interviews with people who are working already in strategic positions in the industry. And because the, the future we're looking at is the, is the near future, three to five years ahead, what you understand, of course, especially if, you, if, you're working, if you're working with feature films, is that that's how long it takes to make a project. So the people who are already thinking about how to develop their platform or what their next project is, they are already today at their offices. They are creating the future five years from now, which means that we're not actually predicting the future. We're describing the future as it is being constructed, and we're asking these kinds of people what their worries and what their concerns and what they're excited about right now. And that actually paints a period specific, I can say now with six reports uh, under our belt, we're pretty good actually at uh, defining what's happening. And that means, because we al always have different topics every year, that you can go to the website and look at like the last two or three reports and they will still be valid and they will still be worth reading even though of course some of the latest numbers you know, are not quite up to date. Uh, they're free to download and you can read the report in less than two hours and it doesn't require any we try at least to, to write them in a way where you don't have to know any jargon. There will be a footnote explaining what all the difficult words mean. Yes, these were the topics of this year's report. I'm not going to talk about all of them today. I'm not going to talk about VR. I'm not going to talk about theatrical. And just for context, I want to remind you about something that we wrote about in one of the uh, earlier years, which is that we are living in an enormous boom in film and, and TV production. You know of course, but in the film industry, our self-image is always that we are in crisis. And in fact, one of our, uh, our, one of our interviewees, Stan Salover, who works uh, with um, the future of the industry in different ways, with uh, Khan and with Storytech in Tallinn and so on, he's also doing his PhD right now. And in his PhD work, he went back and, and looked at when does the crisis in the film industry begin? And the answer is in the 1920s. We have been in a constant state of crisis since the 1920s, that's our self-image. So, <laughs> in that context, let's, let us remember uh, that we're doing pretty well right now. These numbers are very familiar, they're from FX Networks, uh, who are monitoring this in the US. This is the number of original, scripted original series, so no reality, just drama series, uh, in uh, the US. Here we have the year 2002, and there we have the year 2017, which is the latest uh, numbers. And as you know, of course, a lot of new platforms are being added now. This year, within the next 12-month period, starting this month. Uh, so we are projecting, everyone is at assuming that the number of original shows is going to continue to grow for at least, at least three to five years more. We're making more drama than ever for TV, and it's better than ever. This is also a relatively old slide that I've shown many times. It's from the wonderful stephenfollows.com, if you have... Uh, nerdy tendencies. He, he's a Brit who does wonderful statistical work with public data uh, about film. And this is just again to show you the, the, um, the blue line is cinema admission, so number of tickets sold, and the orange line is number of titles that premiere in the cinemas, in this case in the U US and the UK, between uh, the year 2000 and uh, 2016. 
So you can see the tendency here. Uh, what's happened here in between is the digitalization of cinemas, of course, which have given us the wonderful gift that many more titles are available, especially in small towns. It also means uh, that uh, we know that the biggest, the top 10 titles take a larger market share, because of course, even if you live in a small town, you want to see the Marvel movie or whatever it is. Uh, and if you, as you can see here, if the total number of tickets isn't rising, then the, the, the share per film is going to be very low. And a lot of these films are going to be in the theaters for maybe one week, two weeks. They don't have time to build an audience. So we already know that in the cinema window, we are very bad at connecting. Even the good films don't necessarily find an audience. So we're making content that is fantastic, but connecting it to the viewers is uh, a bit of a challenge. And this is just like background for for what we're talking about. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that we have had this massive development in film production. It's cheaper to make films, it's cheaper to distribute films. Uh, and we are making, it's this, these numbers are leveling out in Europe now, so we're up, up on that level uh, where we, well, the, well, the, the curve uh, across Europe has been the same. And we've leveled out in the last two years. Now it's approximately the same on that level. But when our resources will be diminish, which they will, as I will come to just now, uh, we have to think about what is the normal level, how many films do we make and release uh, in the cinemas? Is the normal levels the levels where we are now? Or is the normal level, what, what do we consider a sustainable level? Is it going to be halfway or is it going to be where we were 15 years ago? And that's really a big question for us to consider as we move forward. Because the public funding of audiovisual storytelling is directly threatened in Europe and in many other places. Populist and ultranationalist parties are shaping public policy. They're doing this through winning elections, so do directly, but they're also doing this indirectly, just through existing and existing in political discourse and forcing the other parties to triangulate towards the right. And in culture, cultural policy terms, this tendency means, tends to mean funding cuts across the board. These kinds of parties are not fans of cultural funding at all. And they are also doing a lot of targeted efforts to shut down uh, programs that have a symbolic value for their politics. So minority voices, equality programs, anything that is experimental or niche. And now even, we have seen it, even in the Nordic countries, this idea that co-productions are suspect because they are foreign. Um, and of course, where actual fascists uh, do get to, to into power, censorship also follows. But even before the censorship comes the self-censorship, and we're seeing effects of that uh, even across Europe. Also in Brazil, we saw an example this year where the election of Bolsonaro about a year ago uh, meant that overnight, again, and it, this was not even a, dis a decision that they made in the Department of Culture, just political signaling was enough to take all the money out of the public-private uh, funds, which are, is how the film industry is funded in, the, in Brazil, and moving it to education. And nobody can argue, I mean, more funding for education is great, right? Except that now suddenly you don't have a film industry, so that's a problem for the film industry. Nationalists and populists are also not uh, fond of the free press for obvious reasons, and this affects funding for public service media houses, and that has uh, side effects, uh, collateral damage, uh, because uh, for us, because film and uh, public service houses tend to be big investors in film and TV drama in the local languages, and they are very important buyers and uh, screening platforms for local and niche content. The overall political situation where all of this is happening with rapidly increasing costs for climate-related migration and extreme weather events in a destabilizing world with a looming recession, because let's remember that we have a global recession that is overdue, everybody's expecting it to happen at any moment. All of this happening at the same time will make it very, very costly even for sympathetic lawmakers, people who really believe in cultural funding, even for them, it will be very costly to spend political capital defending the arts. And we as an industry and in the art sector more broadly, we haven't been great at explaining and verbalizing and making it real to the politicians, let alone to the voters, why what we do is important. And the prognosis over the next several decades, to be clear, is that all of this will get significantly worse. Even relatively small climate change, by which I mean the climate change that has already happened, that, that we cannot roll back, is going to affect global food production and make many areas uninhabitable. This is going to drive social unrest, it's going to force hundreds of millions of humans on the move, and of course this migration will put pressure on the nation state and on welfare states in particular. All of these headlines, uh, I will remind you, are just from like the last week. 
this is happening now. The climate crisis, this climate change is not a theoretical possibility. This isn't about, oh, the future of our children. No, this is happening right now. We came very close to losing the city of Venice this week. That's where we are right now. So then when we're saying, oh, but maybe we need 20 more million for film funding. Yes, I mean, yes, we do. But this is the context in which these conversations politically we will have. And this is happening at the exact historic moment where automation, completely unrelated, but it's happening right now, automation is changing our labor markets completely, challenging the idea of a good citizen being a laborer whose work we can tax. So even without a massive global humanitarian crisis and an extinction level threat to our species uh, coinciding with these structural changes, just this in itself would be likely to benefit populists in elections. Some very intelligent people say that 10 years from now, we will no longer have truck drivers in the Europe or in the US. That whole profession is going to disappear. And I don't know how truck drivers vote. I hope they will vote sensibly. But I, I'm pretty sure how unemployed truck, truck drivers vote. And that's not going to be for a pro-science, world-saving agenda. So this was the, the theme of the film festival last year. And, um, and uh, it uh, unfortunately was very apropos for, for what all of our experts and where we ended up with the analysis in the report as well. In the best case scenario, 10 to 15 years from now, uh, the financial realities of the global middle classes will look quite different than they do today. And I would just remind you that the global middle classes, that's our audience. That's, you know, that's the people who pay for entertainment. That's certainly the people who pay for culture. And in situations of crisis, and certainly in a global recession, the money that people have to spend uh, goes down. And that effect is probably going to be delayed because there are so many big financial interests invested in these new platforms. So, so uh, the effect is probably going to be later, but be, be delayed. But long term, the public money is threatened. And in addition, the consumer spending is probably also threatened by these same effects. And I mean, that's the best case scenario. And the worst case scenario, young people of today will see about 2 billion dead from climate related, related crisis in uh, their lifetimes. And this means that every individual and every organization, there's nothing you can do. There's no question for you to approach that is more important than the survival of our civilization and of our species and of like mammal life on this planet. And it means that, that on the individual level and the national level, every art project you make, every, you know, um, every political choice you make, everything has to be understood in, in this context because and I mean, you can think about it politically or ethically. I have a duty to save the world. Or you can think about it from the perspective of, like, I like to pay my rent. But soon, like this, it, it doesn't matter what on what grounds you make this choice. This is the reality in which we are all operating uh, now. So why was I talking about fascists before? Yeah, it's connected to this as well uh, on many levels. And one of them is that we have this idea that arts is a vaccine against fascism. And clearly that is not, you know, it's not that simple because we have free arts in Europe, certainly. And we also have fascists marching in our streets and populists winning elections. But it's important also that fascists believe very strongly that that art has an impact and that the, the stories that we tell are important. That's, of course, why they like to make a lot of um, choices and to cut funding and, and to protest the art that they don't like and, and so on. And we've been seeing this, of course, in Sweden in the last few months uh, as well. These two pictures I usually don't have to explain in Europe. I certainly didn't have to explain them in Germany. The Americans, of course, don't know what's happening here. This is the Antarctic Kunst exhibition uh, where uh, the Nazi, during the Nazi regime where they uh, collected perverse art, modernism and things like that, to an exhibition to show how perverted the arts were. Uh, that like, can go a little bit in different directions, because some people looked at this and went like, yes, this is amazing. Uh, and then, of course, we have Lene Riefenstahl, who was a great filmmaker, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, who put her considerable skills to the service of an agenda of death. Populists are great storytellers. That's why they win elections. But they are dangerous because of how they construct dramatic tension. The monster is always an other. The monster is always a threat against conformity. And this in itself is a reason for us to continue to resist and to manifest a multiplicity of voices and representations. And another reason, of course, is purely ethical. Uh, in English, we say no taxation without representation. And what we mean by that is in political terms, if I pay taxes, I have a right to be represented, for instance, in, in parliament in some sense, in some way. 
Um, but also, literally, when we talk about representation on film, perhaps we should think about it in the same way. If we are making art with public money, perhaps all of the citizens who are paying taxes or who are operating in this system have the right to be represented on screen as well. And perhaps not only in stories about their troubles, and, and if you know if these are underserved the groups, in stories about their, uh, about their difficulties, but also in stories about legends and, and dreams. And it is interesting to me that in this balance, uh, popular entertainment is leading the way. Popular entertainment, of course, is perhaps when we're looking at reaching the big audiences, much more important even than, the, than art house uh, cinema is. Um, a year and a half ago, when I was presenting the previous year's report, I remember I said in, the, in my talk that this movie is going to make a billion dollars, and people were literally laughing in the audience. To me, that was a completely uncontroversial position, position and it proved to be right. What I didn't predict was for this uh, film, Black Panther, to, to earn a Best Picture nomination at the Oscars. And now I wonder how many of you have seen Black Panther? Okay, about half. It's interesting because, and, and that, that, means, that means probably that this room skews younger than a lot of the places where I talk. Often it's less than 10%, which is astounding, you know, when you think about how popular this film was. Obviously, it's a superhero movie. It's also a moral fable about the ethical validity of different strategies for fighting oppression. Uh, so it's very uh, timely, uh, also in that sense. I, I really do recommend it. It's like a fairy tale movie. Uh, if you go in with the, with the expectation of a deeply political fairy tale adventure, you're going to have a very good experience. We have to stop con conceptualizing films that are about or uh, um, entertaining underprivileged audience groups as some kind of progressive political charity. And I'm ashamed to say that in this industry, we still talk about it a little bit in that tone. Like, oh yeah, but it's very important that we also tell these stories. Yes, well, uh, the market has proven again and again and again that audiences are ahead of the industry on these issues. Audiences are ready. Audiences have been ready. Fast and the Furious franchise. When, we know when, when people in Hollywood were saying nobody wants to see films with, with non-white actors in the main characters, and then we were on Fast and the Furious 7 at that point, I'm thinking like, no, like our own data shows that this is wrong. And there's a really important word to pay attention to, especially if you read the industry paper, and that, that word is overperform. So when we say that a title is overperforming, what does that mean? It means that relative to our expectations, the audience likes it more. And very, very often, overperform is code for the audience liked, the audience accepted a film about black people, the audience accepted a film about gay people. How about, we're, where are we placing the problem with the audience? Clearly, it's our expectations that are broken, right? If, it's, if it says Jordan Peele's latest movie overperforms, maybe what, we, what it should say is uh, expectations under rated for Jordan Peele's industry fails again at understanding audience. That's the news, right? It's not that the film is better than expected. What is a hero? What is a human? What is dignity? What is constructive? What is love? What is hope? What is reality? These are the kinds of questions that the market cannot answer on its own. And of course, that's why I'm especially um, proud of the fact that these kinds of films can exist, made in the US, made uh, in Europe. These, of course, are both uh, gay narratives, which are also talking about some other intersection like poverty, uh, like uh, migration in Europe, uh, where, which are films that overperformed, that is, the, the audience was ready when we, even we who funded these films thought that it was not. But when the market performs these tasks with more relevance than the industry, we have to ask ourselves, what the hell are we doing? Last year we saw an EU decision to enforce local content quotas on VOD services. Uh, and I should say that in the Nordic countries, the Nordic countries politically, we didn't, we didn't support this in the EU. We were looking for other solutions. But the way the EU works is that now this is what we're going to do, and this is also how, how it's going to be legislated in our countries, of course. And the purpose of this local content, by which we mean European content quotas on the VOD services, was to, to force the US companies, the US giants, to contribute money to the European production economy. And that goal, I think, is like, very sensible. Of course, in some way, they have to do it. And I made the classic mistake of reading comment sections. I went on Hollywood Reporter and, and Screen and these kinds of um, and variety and looked at the reporting about this. And then I looked what the Americans are writing in the comments. And it's funny, and you have to remember that the film industry, American, like, that's a very progressive, very uh, by American standards, very sort of left-wing uh, environment. 
but they were outraged. They were like, oh, Europe has finally like jumped the shark. Europe has given up the, 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 the ambition to compete with quality storytelling. Now they will all only compete with these quotas, blah, blah, blah. And I realized that these people, I mean, sensibly, why would they? But they don't, they have no idea how our production economies work at all. Why is it important to get tax money into the system? What do we do with this tax money? So I made a little list and I put it in the report. Uh, here are some of the ways in which American companies continue to benefit from the European system. By securing investment in and acquiring content uh, funded with tax incentives or public money, by working locally and in the US with talent educated at our European publicly funded film schools, relying on publicly funding film archives uh, careers that are nurtured at our publicly funded festivals and markets, where US companies too are welcome to show and sell their product. And ultimately, by making US film in an aesthetic language whose development is to a very great degree funded by uh, our countries, uh, and not just us, also of course Canada, Brazil, so on, countries where we believe that formal experimentation has inherent worth. The market is not going to carry artistic experimentation. We understand this, the risk of failure is too high. And that is one of the things that we do with the public money in the European system. And then, of course, you know, five years down the line, ten years down the line, those new aesthetic approaches to cinematic storytelling are going to trickle into Hollywood and become mainstream uh, filmmaking. And this list continues, of course, infrastructure investments. I haven't even talked about, you know, fiber and digitalization of cinemas and so on. We're doing a lot of things with this public money to maintain not just like how many crowns are going into your budget from Svenska Film Institute, but also like the wider ecosystem of filmmaking in general. And we're going to have to ask ourselves, I mean, I wrote that list because I was annoyed at some Americans, but I'm thinking now that we, we need to think about that list ourselves as well here in Europe and certainly here in Sweden. Public funding over time is going to diminish. I think it's inevitable because of the ma macro trends in society. So we have to ask ourselves, what cannot exist? What can we not exist without? And it's a thought experiment to think about at least all of the things that we're doing with public money now. What happens if that money goes away? Could we have, what if we don't have film schools anyway, anymore? Well, I guess we could have uh, a ladling system. We could, we could have trainees, right? But would that, be, would that make our, our filmmaking, filmmakers more diverse or less diverse? Like that's a real question to think about. Um, my gut says less, but maybe then we'd, then we'd have to work with that. How do we... Can we replace public funding of film archives with something? No, like probably not. I think if we want film archives, we're probably going to have to make, make damn sure that that money is future-proofed, and so on, and so on. More public-private partnerships, perhaps? Yes, we haven't worked like that traditionally. Could we work like that traditionally? And if you are a filmmaker who already is finding it hard to get access to the public money, perhaps you should be a trailblazer in finding that money somewhere else, because everybody is going to have to make this adjustment eventually. I'm looking at my time, I'm doing pretty well, I'm just over halfway. Uh, I'm going to stop talking about uh, the film industry, uh, about public funding now, and uh, spend the rest of the time talking about uh, streaming. Yes, so we're looking at three to five years from now, and, and just this uh, year, <laughs> Looking three, three to five years ahead is super convenient because nobody understands what's happening right now with the streaming wars that have started this month with all the new services. But like three to five years from now, we're pretty sure what's going to have happened at that point, right? So we know that the streaming media landscape will find its new, new form. Streaming will be the replacement of what we have traditionally known as television. And probably that market globally is going to be um, dominated by a handful of companies. Those companies are probably going to be Google, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, and Disney. Or maybe not, but that's like there's going to be about five of them that are globally dominant, or certainly at least in the West. Uh, we also know that niche services that are take a very small market share but do something very specialized are probably going to exist, and we probably we are can also be pretty sure that if your first language is not English, you're going to want content still in your local language. So we're going to have like national or regional dominance. There will be you know, an Arte or a Via Play or a Seymour that becomes a big player. In, the, in, in a number of local countries or in a local country, probably based on like language uh, groups more than anything else. Um, and then we have this mid-layer of, of everybody who wants to be on the top, uh, Facebook, AT&T, Time Warner, uh, Comcast, NBC, CBS, Viacom, and so on. And all of those are very well funded and all of those are fighting 
very aggressively now, and most of those are not going to be in the top five because there's just more there's more of them than five. So most of those are not going to be in the top five, and we don't exactly know what's going to happen uh, there with those. And I should also add that in in uh, markets outside the Europe and the U.S., uh, I think Chinese companies are going to do very well, and we know that there are at least two Chinese companies that do have the muscle to to take on all of these these competitions. There's uh, numbers now that, that uh, the number of uh, subscription is in general for for um, streaming services is expected to, dub to double uh, in the next six years. But that number is not, uh, it, it's not going to continue to grow exponentially, especially not if the global economy goes down. So people are going to be selective, so we're probably going to see more ad financed streaming Probably, and then it's going to be quite a lot like television in the end, uh, anyway. Except you pick when, the, when, when, and what you see. Um, the film industry, in particular, has really struggled to grasp the enormity of what it means that these tech companies are now uh, entering this um, this market. We're still talking a lot about Netflix, and we're still fighting about what is a film, and like is Roma a film? Yes, it's a film. Like, and, but at, at this point, it's also like if Martin Scorsese makes a 160 million dollar film. I don't care what its first window is. I think we're going to have to agree that it's a movie, like that's a movie. <laughs> that's probably going to be, have to be a film. Uh, and, and it's also, there's this weird hypocrisy in this because a lot of us are still bitching about streaming in conferences like this and then we all go home and watch Netflix in the evening and feel that it's like profoundly unfair that streaming services are like taking the audiences with their quality content. <laughs> I, it, that's just silly. Like I think we're going to have to accept that this this change has happened uh, now, and that Netflix is the least of our worries, right? Netflix is is the least terrifying uh, of all of these these competitors. Netflix financed its growth by just generating an enormous debt in the September of this year. The number was 12.43 billion dollars, um, and. People who are counting on this are saying that they have so many subscribers now that if they don't get completely like annihilated by Disney Plus, probably they're going to make this money back over time. Like Netflix has a decent chance of either being sold to someone like Apple or just like earning the money. But in the end, their business model is very simple. Money comes in from subscriptions, money goes out to production and, and advertising. That's it. Uh, they have to make more money than they spend at some point for them to be a successful company. Now, that is not the case of any of these other new competitors, basically. This is a really old picture that I have to stop showing now, but it's just so uh, visually satisfying. <laughs> Over there you have Apple, Amazon, and Alphabet. This is uh, market valuations of these companies. You can measure company sizes in different ways, but this is one of them. It's just very easy. Facebook. And then here we have Disney, which now, of course, is the same pile as Fox. And it's also grown, so it, it's almost, it's not quite Facebook sized, but it's almost there. Comcast, Netflix, so, oh, there have been more mergers, so this isn't up to date anymore. But it just gives some idea of like how much bigger are the tech companies than even someone terrifying like Netflix. And the answer is a lot bigger. You, what you can also do is you can just go on Wikipedia and take a, a look at the world's top 10 largest companies by market valuation, uh, market capitalization. If you look at the numbers from 10 years ago, it would be mostly oil companies, things like that. If you look at the last quarter's uh, numbers, the top 10 companies in the world, uh, JP Morgan, Morgan Chase is a bank, but like seven out of 10 are media companies. And all of those seven out of 10 are also tech companies like Alphabet, which is Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Alibaba, and so on. Um, so net, the goal of Netflix is to have as many subscribers as possible. Uh, and arguably, like Facebook and Google also have a, have a business model where ultimately they, they sell eyeballs to advertisers. But it's much, much more complicated when you think about somebody else. So if we look at Amazon Prime, for instance, uh, the film industry likes to talk about Amazon Prime video as a video service. Like, it's, oh, it's like Netflix. Like, you pay dollars a month, and then you, they, you get to watch video content. And of course, it's true that you get to watch video content, but you also become a prime member of Amazon, which means if you live in a market where Amazon is present, you can buy everything from Amazon and have the delivery becomes free. Media, electronics, groceries, household goods, books, clothes, toys, and many other things. If you live in a, in a US city with a Whole Foods, you can have like a drone bring your milk to your house if you're an Amazon Prime member. So it, you become, you buy into a much larger ecosystem and in addition you get to watch some streaming video. Now of course you will immediately understand that the business model 
of like one individual film being profitable is completely irrelevant in this context. And we actually know this because uh, there were some um, there was some data um, reported on by Reuters last year, uh, which was some internal documents that were leaked from Amazon, where we saw that the, the prime signups between 2014 and 2017, about a quarter of those were driven by the video content. So about a quarter of the people, and that, by the way, in 2017, Amazon didn't have that many shows, but, but even, even then, a quarter of the new Prime members came to Amazon Prime because of the video content. And then, of course, they're in the ecosystem, and then they're going to spend a ton of money on all of these other things. Uh, just the membership revenue of Amazon Prime, uh, which is, I think, not a public number, but people have counted on this, uh, the calculation is probably more than $9 billion out annually just in membership revenue. And they, of course, have the, the rights, you know, to, the, to, to J.R.R. Tolkien's Middle Earth. And the TV show starts next year. It's budgeted at $20 million per episode. It will be the most expensive TV show ever made. And is it going to be profitable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yes, of course. Because it doesn't, like, they don't have to make the money on the TV show. They make the money on selling milk and books and electronics and so on. So it's probably excellent value. And I, I for one, am looking forward to this show. Uh, <laughs> But this idea of having something else plus media is not new. Disney, of course, is not a technology company in the traditional sense, but they have worked like this always. Uh, in the 80s, when there was a period when before, just leading up to The Little Mermaid, when they couldn't make a movie to save their lives, what kept them in business were the parks and resorts. Uh, so, and this part of, of Walt, they call him Walt, which is interesting. It's like almost like Steve Jobs. This this kind of cult around the founder is very much alive, uh, also at Disney still. Walt used to say this. It's very interesting. Walt uh, knew that you build a world, right? A physical worlds even, but also you build worlds, worlds of dreams. So Disney's business model is selling backpacks and dreams. And what they are really good at, because they're an old company, is, is the long-term plan. In, between 2006 and 2012, uh, Disney acquired three uh, companies. Pixar, which is a magnet for talent, uh, and spouts every year. In a, in a time when we say, oh, original IP can't succeed in the market, nobody wants to see original stories. That's nonsense, obviously, because every year, one of the top ten movies will be a Pixar original IP story. That's a very good investment to own that. Star Wars was the other acquisition. Marvel is the third uh, acquisition. And this has, of course, earned them complete box office domination. So in 2008, when the first Iron Man movie opens, Disney has 10.5% of the US box office that year. Uh, last year, Disney had 26% of the US box office uh, alone. Manola Dargis, who is a very good critic at the New York Times, she wrote, she said, Disney conquered childhood and has now managed to conquer adulthood. So they did three strategic acquisitions. And let's remember that they already had a lot of characters that people were very invest invested in, and now the number of characters that people have that relationship to, that they own, is astronomical. People who are so, are so in emotionally invested in the Disney brands that they will literally tattoo them on their bodies, and they're going to raise, and they, I am also one of these people, obviously. I, I, I also you will, I'm, I'm raising children to make sure that they love Star Wars as much as I do, or something like this. You know, we're perhaps using this in a way where we are um, like my two dime theory is that this is about being living in a secular uh, environment where we don't have a lot of like spiritual stories. So we, we're using instead of the legends and myths, we're telling them, you know, Marvel and Star Wars stories instead. Whatever, that's that's my two dime theory. You don't have to believe that part, but certainly it's a very good generational business that parents raise their kids to love the same characters like, and make sure that they get the backpacks and the bed sheets. So now Disney Plus launched this week, and we're going to see like articles about, oh, they have, they have tech problems. Yes, of course they have tech problems, and people are furious that it hasn't already opened in Sweden, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we'll say, was it a success? Was it not a success? Based on how much money they make. And I think I've illustrated the point now. It doesn't matter how much money they make on Disney Plus, because they are now in our living rooms. They have a direct relationship to my home and my credit card, and that means that you know they can cut and they can make an even bigger cut of my investment my emotional investment in these stories and that also means that when you're making like a low budget film in i don't know western sweden or in karlstad this is your competition 
also. Big problem, little problem. We'll get back to that. Yeah, film by film, episode by episode, companies like this cannot be outspent. Any talent they want, they will work with. And this doesn't mean, by the way, they will automatically succeed. I'm still a little bit doubtful, doubtful for instance, about Apple's um, content choices. Um, but the good news for us in Europe is that all of these major content producers are now transitioning to a model where they are siloing their own, own content into their own exclusive platforms instead of spreading it as wide as they could, which was the old business model. It means that there are places where content is needed with people who used to... There are many networks in the world that used to show eternal reruns of Big Bang Theory or Friends that will now have to show something else during those hours because the, that content is no longer available for those purposes. And that actually probably, I think, represents a real market opportunity for European content, at least for the next uh, five years or, or so. Um, and also, we can think of someone like Apple or Google or Amazon who are all also hardware companies and who are all also marketplaces for each other's content and for other people's content. We can't think of them as directly in competition with Netflix, for instance. I don't think that Apple's grand plan is to like crush Netflix on the number of subscribers. Apple's grand plan is to, is to tie consumers into networks where they sell something else. Amazon wants to sell us milk and books and, and electronics. Apple wants to sell us phones and computers. And the video content and the high quality drama and the film acquisitions are all just part of that world, right? It's a much wider, higher stakes gamble. I think it's, it's possibly better to think of it like they're going to, they're, they're in the mar these three companies are in the business of destroying cable TV as a market, for instance, that's already happening. That's what they're, they're gonna take those kinds of, they're gonna be the hardware business, they're gonna be the like content uh, subscription business, and then they're also going to make some original content, but it, maybe that's not at the heart of what they do. But we don't know exactly how this is gonna play, so I'm not gonna speculate about that right now. Uh, with all that said, this view that I've been talking from about film and, and, and television is incredibly old fashioned. Uh, in that it is so focused still on these traditional distribution windows. And um, if you're under 26, you live today in a media environment that is completely different where most of those things that I have been talking about are relatively irrelevant. Yes, you have the services, yes, to watch the shows, but, but the idea of like a broadcast window of some kind being at the heart of your media consumption is absurd. They've never done it and they never will. So I'll just, this was just a random screen cap that I took from my own Facebook, because I'm over 40, so I'm on Facebook, um, <laughs> that in the week that the report was, um, was uh, released. And I'll just show, like, I'll just translate to you what's happening in these pictures. To some, to some of you, it's obvious. So this is from my Facebook feed. The sender, the sharer, is Reddit slash videos, which, so that's like an, an online community sub, uh, community which is about sharing videos but they also have a Facebook profile where they also share videos and that's how it showed up in my feed uh, and what they shared was like a one minute clip from Twitch which is an online streaming service one of the biggest ones in the world you can read about it in the very first uh, Nostradamus report and if you don't know about Twitch find out please because you're in trouble um, so this from somebody's Twitch seen a one minute clip which is called The Awakening. And in Twitch, people live stream themselves playing computer games or anything. Quite often, they just live stream themselves talking to the camera and hanging out. And then they have viewers. And the viewers, there's also an economy. The viewers can give them like tips, money, directly as they're watching. So what's happening here is Jesse D, man in the picture, streams. And he's playing, Jesse D streams, playing. And he's not playing. He just is just chatting. So he was chatting online. And then he fell in, asleep in front of his webcam and the internet went bananas as you can imagine and they're like did he die no he didn't die oh my god is he gonna wake up and they're betting and like they're you know oh, you gotta see this guy is asleep on the internet blah, blah. and they're sharing it and they're giving him money and so on and this clip that was shared was just him waking up like this and he looks over to his other monitor and he can see the people are like cheering in the comments and he's giving him money and then he looks like this a little bit happy and that's the whole clip. And it's like, it's the most human thing I have seen, you know, on a screen this year. Roma included, right? Uh, and then the, when it was shared with, man wakes up after sleeping for three hours on stream to find he has 200 viewers. Yes, so he, at the time, right, 200 viewers. This clip, by the time I saw it, two and a half million. 
viewers. And variants, of course, of this clip have been shared in many other places as well. This is the media landscape where, very rapidly, because of how linear time works and people are aging, right, the majority of our consumers, our audience, are living in this media environment, where it took me like five minutes to even just explain this one picture. <laughs> So that's a bit of a problem. And right now, I, I, the only thing I can say about that, because I'm running out of time, is if you don't have people, if you don't work daily with people who are under 26, you're in trouble. And if you, have, if you are working with people who are under 26, when they look like they don't understand something, or when you look like you don't understand something they're saying or doing, that's not when you should like move on. That's when you should stop and ask and talk until you figure out what's actually going on, right? Because the answers to a lot of the things that we've been talking about is going to be here. Like, it's completely different kinds of things. Can we uh, compete with Netflix in a traditional, essentially, like, TV environment? Well, probably not, no. And certainly not with Apple's, like, unending coffers of money. But here, all bets are off. Apple has no idea what to do in this space. I mean, today, most of, let's face it, neither do we. But we can at least move there because we're agile. It's really curious that the film industry, which is so welcoming of, of new technology in production and screening, can be so incredibly archaic in other, um, in other contexts. We're faxing contracts, we're doing funding applications on paper. It's insane. We're traveling for two days to pitch for five, 15 minutes. It's completely unsustainable. Uh, and part of this has to do with the fact still that we have this idea in this industry that technology is somehow the enemy. And I know that this goes back to the 90s and when Silicon Valley starts um, and the way that they are, you know, and, and uh, Apple is having these big advertising campaigns that you will remember if you're middle-aged that said, rip, mix, burn. They didn't know about copyright. They didn't understand why it's important. They do now, because they're content producers now. They care a hell of a lot about copyright. The tech companies have learned a lot from the content production industry, but we are still going like la 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 when, when, it's about, when, when we talk about learning from them. And that's a real problem. Our successors are not waiting for permission to innovate. I wonder if we are recruiting the best young people to this industry or if they enter our offices or look at our content and throw their hands up in, in despair and go and do something on YouTube instead. I'm not sure about the answer to this question, but if you don't have a 26-year-old in, in the office, probably the answer is we're not doing great here. Uh, and the, the other thing is that now we're waking up to the fact, oh, technology is really important. But because historically we haven't been interested in it, we don't know very much about it. So that's a bit of a problem as well. So we're very easy to fool. Like I think the number of really dubious blockchain startups that I've heard pitch at different conferences in the last few years is, is a lot. Like, And then there are two maybe that I was like, OK, but this makes sense. And most of it is complete nonsense if you know anything about technology. But we have to allow ourselves the time to learn about what makes sense, what is a reasonable proposition, what's actually useful so that we can use these tools. Um, this industry has a problem, and the problem is that there is no such thing as the industry. We have different, even within the different silos of film and television and so on, even inside those, we operate as though we are at war with each other. All of our different unions and all of the different platforms and all of the different um, distribution windows are fighting each other instead of thinking about what is the long term, uh, what is long term sustainability for this industry. And if we want to do things like adjust the window system or figure out the licensing for online content or things like that, we have to look beyond our short term interests and to start to think about what our co collective long term interests are. And we all pretend still you will hear people say like, oh, well, in this new landscape, well, I don't know how new it is. You know, it's been 14 years with the iPhone now. 14 years. <laughs> I think we're just going to have to accept that this is the landscape. And it's been the landscape for quite some time, and now we're going to have to actually solve these problems. So we need to discuss on the national, European, and global levels what is the audiovisual culture that we want, what is it for, what are the behaviors the audience has already chosen, and so on. Um, and that is where I'm going to end this. I'm going to quote my own report. It's a very classy move. How do you compete when there is always competition that can outrun you, outspend you, produce content of a very high quality, only with relevance? When we speak about the importance of curation, what we mean is selecting for relevance. Relevance will power local languages, VOD services. Relevance will power public service media, niche and genre subscription, your local art house cinema, and ultimately all the consumer to consumer distribution that is uh, clearly going to happen as well. Relevance ultimately is an artistic problem. Relevance is about telling stories that mean something to the audience. That's where representation comes in 
that's where the multiplicity of voices comes in. It's a business problem when, we're, when our content isn't connecting to the audience. And you cannot blame the media landscape that we've been living in for a decade now for that. It's definitely an artistic problem. We have to tell more relevant stories. I'm sorry, it's a banal answer. It's always been the answer. It's still the answer. Uh, and if we're not connecting with the audience, most of that, like 75% of that, is because we're not doing a good enough job <laughs> on relevance. The last 25%, a little bit of tech problems. We're going to adjust that, I think, over time. <laughs> Thank you very much.